Somebody say amen. Praise the Lord, church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Tell you what, I was telling somebody when I came in this morning, I uh, think I ate a little bit too much last night. And I had to wear uh, my biggest suit to accommodate. And uh, I don't know if anybody else had that problem. But we'll get through it. Amen. We're going to turn to the book of Psalms this morning. Psalm 34. And verses 17 and 18. And we'll have some other verses of scripture throughout as I'm speaking this morning. And I'm just believing the Lord for a good time in his house today. Throughout the whole day. And I believe God wants to meet us here. Yes, I've he felt his presence already, so maybe I should say I know he's here. Right, right. And God wants to bless each and every one of you today. And I believe that he will do that. Amen. 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 As we reach to him today. Psalm 34, verse 17 and 18 says, The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth. And delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. And saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Amen. Going to talk a little bit this morning on desperate times call for desperate measures. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Now, this saying is thought to have originated from Hippocrates, the Greek physician, from whom also we have the Hippocratic Oath. And some of you may be a little more familiar with that than maybe some of us others this morning. But Desperate times call for desperate measures simply means actions that might seem extreme under normal circumstances are appropriate during adversity in hard times. They might seem a little over the top under normal circumstances, but when you're facing adversity, it becomes normal. Now, there's some, maybe some simple examples we could think of today that maybe we've even faced and they really don't matter too much, maybe to anybody else, but the one going through it, it matters a whole lot. The mom with some children that won't behave themselves. Sit down and be quiet. And I almost used the word Johnny or the name Johnny. And I wasn't meaning him, but it just came to mind, and I kind of caught myself, but then I told on myself. But but sit down and behave yourself, and they don't do it, and so you say, go stand in the corner or whatever means of other punishment you might have to try to get them to behave themselves, or, you know, I'm going to take your iPhone or your iPad or whatever away for a time, and whatever electronic device that they enjoy using, that doesn't work. And the parent is at their wit's end. Any of you ever been there, parents? At your wit's end? And so mom says, it's the, it's the last straw, and she's at her wit's end, and so she says, what? Exactly. Wait till dad gets home. That's the last ditch effort. That's showing that she's in a desperate time, and she's going to resort to a desperate measure. Amen. Or how about someone trying to get something out of the uh, vending machine? Sounds like some of you have been there. Put the money in. You know you, know you put the right amount in. And you, you hit the right button. And you, you know you did that. You double check. Make sure you hit the right button. And nothing comes out. And you look in the slot. Yep, there's something there. So it should have come out. So what do you do? 
You shake that machine, of course. Bang on it a little bit, shake that machine, try to get out what is due to you. Amen. And obviously there's other things that we could talk about this morning. I won't take the time to mention anything else. I think you get the point. You know, these are trivial things that we go through in life, these that we've talked about right now. But, you know, there's some more important things that we face in life that are desperate times. And we all have difficult times in life, adversity that we face. The Bible's filled with examples, and it's a common theme throughout Scripture. For all of mankind, Job 14, verse number 1 says, Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Full of trouble, full of adversity. We all face it. And sometimes when we're facing that adversity, if we have not prepared ourselves correctly, and what I mean by correctly, if we have not prepared our heart in the presence of God beforehand when times are good, it's hard to face that adversity and know what to do. And it seems like there's... No answer. I'd like to read a story to you. As an example here. It says, his surgery is scheduled for tomorrow morning. Now, this is an, an older story, and this happened back in May of 2003. But it says, his surgery is scheduled for tomorrow morning at St. Mary's Hospital in Grand Junction, Colorado. And his harrowing, harrowing story has been carried in newspapers, on television, and around the world since this 27-year-old didn't show up for work in his hometown of Aspen on Tuesday morning. It's not the kind of celebrity status that anyone would be willing or would willingly choose, that's for sure. It had been just a matter of a few weeks before that he had told the Aspen Times that even though he has a mechanical engineering degree from Carnegie Mellon University, he felt compelled to quit his budding corporate career at Intel so he could throw himself into his lifelong love of mountaineering. For this seasoned expert, it was only supposed to be a day-long adventure in the extreme sport of canyoneering. It combines hiking and climbing up, then down rugged, remote terrain, using rock climbing gear to negotiate narrow canyons. After solo winter expeditions to the summit of 49 out of the 54 peaks in Colorado that are 14,000 feet and above since December 1998, a few hours hiking around Blue John Canyon in southeastern Utah's Canyonlands National Park seemed like it would be a picnic, or some might say a walk in the park. But something went badly wrong this day for Aaron Ralston. On Saturday afternoon, April 26, 2003, as the scrappy mountain climber moved through a three-foot-wide slot canyon, he pushed his arm into a crack in the canyon wall, and a 1,000-pound slab of sandstone suddenly shifted and broke loose, crushing his right hand and forearm and pinning him in a horrifying excruciating prison. He tried to use his ropes and anchors to free himself, but couldn't budge the massive boulder. Day turned to night and hours turned to days as Aaron, who had narrowly escaped death in an avalanche in February, was forced to wait for help that was unlikely to arrive. By Tuesday morning, he had completely exhausted his water supply. And by Thursday morning, after five agonizing days of forced standing in the unforgiving elements of the remote Utah wilderness, he realized that drastic measures would have to be taken if he was going to survive. Aaron Ralston had only two choices as the sun rose over Blue John Canyon last Thursday morning. 
He could die with his arm trapped beneath a 1,000 pound boulder alone in the desert or he could do the unthinkable. He could amputate his right arm with his own pocket knife. Utah Park Ranger Steve Swanky was in awe. I've never seen anybody who has such a will to live and is as much of a warrior as Aaron is, and I've been doing this for 25 years. Because of his strong desire to live, Ralston was somehow able to tie a tourniquet to his right arm and then painstakingly, crudely, sever the crushed limb just below the elbow with his own knife. Once the grim task was done, he found a way to set up his climbing ropes with one hand, his climbing ropes and his hooks. Then he repelled 60 feet down, straight down the rock wall to the canyon floor where he began the arduous trek back to his vehicle. That's where rescuers found him late Thursday morning, or Thursday afternoon rather, bloody and dehydrated, staggering along a stream. What was left of his right arm was still wrapped in the tourniquet, and he was only two miles from his car. He had walked seven miles with his wound, and he was quickly airlifted out of the canyon by the rescue helicopter to St. Mary's Hospital in Grand Junction, where the veteran climber was listed in serious condition. Authorities and medical experts say that if Ralston had not cut off his arm to free himself, he would surely have died from one of many causes, dehydration, exposure, effects from his crushed limb, and so on. Utah rescue helicopter pilot Terry Mercer says if Ralston had not made the decision to cut off his arm, he would never have survived. He told ABC News, where Aaron was pinned, we went back in there, looked at the spot that he was pinned, and it was such a narrow canyon, and the overlap was so severe that if we could fly right directly over, we never would have spotted him. Out of time and out of options, it was a desperate time, to say the least, that called for a desperate measure. As I read this in preparing for this morning, and I finished reading it, I was thinking, would, would I have done what he did? Would, have, would have I been able to, to do what he did, tie that tourniquet around his arm and, and cut off his own arm? The conclusion that I came to is, yeah, I probably could have done it, but only if I was absolutely sure that either I wasn't going to be able to free myself or that help most likely was not going to come in time. It was a desperate situation that he was in, to say the least. In 1 Samuel 21, David finds himself in a very desperate situation of his own, but he is facing more than the threat of losing his arm. He's facing the threat of losing his life. 1 Samuel 21, starting to read at verse number 10, it says, And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul, and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David, the king of the land? Did they not, did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? And David laid, laid up his words, or these words, in his heart, and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. And he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself in their hands and scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down on his beard. Then Achish, or then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, ye see the man is mad. Wherefore then have ye brought him to me? Have I need of madmen that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Continuing on in chapter 22, the first couple of verses, says David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. 
And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, gathered themselves together unto him. And he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. Here David is running for his life from King Saul, and he decides to hide out in the enemy's city of Gath. We might recognize that name of that city as the city from which Goliath is from. And David runs to this city for refuge, most likely thinking that it was a least likely place for King Saul to be looking for him. But the people recognize him. And really, when you think about it, I'm surprised, yeah, on one hand it, was, it made sense, but on the other hand, it's like, why would you go there? You just killed their champion. You don't think they're going to recognize you? So there he is, and they do recognize him, and he's in a desperate situation, running from his, or for his life from King Saul at the beginning, and now in fear of his own life from the people of Gath and the king of Gath. And so he comes up with this solution to feign himself mad. He faked being insane, began to scratch at the door of the gate and to let his saliva dribble down on his beard and make it look like he's insane. And the king of Gath wants nothing to do with him and lets him go. And he escapes here to the cave of Adullam. If you look at Psalm 34, we read the first two verses, um, or 17 and 18, two verses from there at the outset this morning. If you look at the top of Psalm 34, most likely in your Bible, it's going to have a little writing that says, a Psalm of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. Most likely when David ran to the cave of Adullam, this psalm, he began to pen the words for this psalm right there. Facing death, facing adversity from more than one direction. And he sits down in this cave and begins to pen the words to this Psalm 34. I will bless I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears they looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Amen. There he is in his time, and there were other times in his life of adversity, but this particular time, of adversity, and he begins to pen these words, I will bless the Lord at all times. And sometimes we're guilty, myself included, of when we're facing adversity, poor me, sitting down and wondering, why me? Why is this going on? But David, as he's sitting there in the cave of Adullam, gives us a lesson on praise, gives us a lesson on what we should do when we face adversity. I will bless the Lord at all times. I'd like to talk about four things that we can learn about these verses in Psalm 34. Number one is the frequency of our praise. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. Not just when things are going good. 
Not just when everything's going like we want it to, but even when we're facing adversity, and I would say even especially when we're facing adversity, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. As humans, we're, we're guilty of, and I'll speak for myself, I guess. I'm guilty of, at times, not praising the Lord when I should. Not continually praising the Lord. But I think it would do us all good to learn from what David was going through here that we're talking about this morning. Even in his time, his desperate time of adversity. To have the wherewithal and to have the knowledge and to have the understanding of how God works. And how that God will come to the rescue. And that we can praise Him and we should praise Him even in our tough times. There is never a circumstance so low in our life where we shouldn't be able to muster up the ability to praise the Lord because He is so worthy of praise this morning. We should be resolved with David this morning to say, I will bless the Lord at all times and His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Number two is the attitude of praise. Verse 2 says, David said, My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. And I thought, how long has it been since I've bragged on the Lord? How long has it been since I've said, God is good. Since I've talked to maybe fellow, you know, co-workers or maybe someone on the street that I was talking with or someone as I'm shopping somewhere or just... Just anybody, a friend, family member, whoever. How long has it been since I've said, you know, God is good. And begin to brag on him a little bit and tell, tell him what, what God's done for you. Amen. He boasts in the Lord. Again, don't forget where he's sitting. Don't forget where he is and what he's going through while he's penning these words. I, I'm going to brag on God a little bit today. I'm going to brag on him. Yes, I know I'm sitting in the cave. I know that I'm facing someone coming and searching for me. And if they find me, they're going to kill me. I know I'm facing all of that. And not just someone, but the people of the whole city. And the king of the enemy city. And King Saul. I'm facing all of that. But I, I know how good my God is. I'm going to brag on him a little bit. The second half of that verse 2 says, The humble shall hear thereof and be glad prideful people are not excited about praising God prideful people are not excited about boasting on God instead they're they're excited about boasting on themselves they're excited about someone boasting on them as well but instead we look at first Peter Five and verse number six it instructs us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Colossians three and verse number twelve says to put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. Now these are things that probably we're not going to be able to put on in and of our own abilities. So we're going to have to have the help of the Spirit to do that. But we're instructed to do it. Humbleness of mind. The humble will hear and be glad. You see someone that is excited about someone's testimony of what God's done for them. That's a humble person. Because they're excited about what God did for somebody. If they begin to brag on God in their life, that's a humble person. They're not bragging on themselves. They're bragging on what God did. They're putting the attention on God and not upon themselves or on anybody else. Amen. It does us good when we're facing adversity. 
to brag on God. It changes our whole outlook on things and we begin to realize what God's done for us. Amen. The third thing I'd like to mention is the togetherness or the unity of praise. He said in verse 3, David said in verse 3, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. It's one thing to praise the Lord by ourselves, and, and we can do that and we should do that. But it's a strength to us when we can find somebody else and begin to magnify the Lord with them. When we can find somebody, maybe, maybe they know exactly what we're going through. Maybe they don't. Maybe you feel comfortable because they do know what, what you're going through and you want to just put your arm around them and they'll put their arm around you and begin to magnify the Lord. Begin to lift Him up and begin to say praises and sing praises unto the Lord. Amen. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. It does us good to do that. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 12 says that a threefold cord is not easily broken. So when we find somebody else to help us magnify the Lord and we find somebody else to help us and you know to worship the Lord and to praise the Lord together to exalt his name together that union is not going to be broken very easily. The scripture instructs us that it's very strong. And when the enemy tries to break that up, he's going to have a difficult time doing it. Amen. And we'll feel that strength as well when we begin to magnify the Lord together and exalt his name. Amen. And the last thing that I want to mention regarding this passage for, of praise is that there is always a reason to praise. Praise might be the, un, you know, the most uncommon thing for us to do, we may think, when we're facing adversity. Maybe it's, ex it's extraordinary in our mind and in our way of thinking. But according to the scripture, according to the example that David gave us, it's, it's a good reason to praise the Lord. It's a good reason to lift up his name, to exalt his name. David said... And I'd like to read verses 4 through 7. David said that I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he delivered me out of all my fears. That's a good reason to praise the Lord. I sought the Lord. He heard me, delivered me from all my fears. I wonder, is anybody in the house that God has delivered you from something? Has God ever heard your prayers? That's something good to praise the Lord about. Amen. Has anybody been afraid and God delivered you from your fears? Amen. They looked to him and were lightened. Their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried. The Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Amen. It's, it's so good to know that we have a God who cares. We have a God that will deliver. We have a God that we can exalt and we can magnify. And he will meet our needs. Amen. We can worship him. We can bless his name. We can, we can praise him and exalt him. And we can be strengthened. And he will deliver us out of all of our trouble. Amen. I'm thankful today that we have a God that we can serve and we can praise and we can live for. We can bless his name. Amen. I'm wondering, maybe today, there's a um, passage in the book of Mark, chapter 5, and I didn't give these verses to the sound crew this morning, but I, I want to I wanna just mention a few things about Mark chapter 5. It's a familiar passage of scripture, 
It's about the demoniac of Gadara. The Bible lets us know that this, this man was bound by legions of demons, legions of devils. And the people of the city were trying to always bind him with chains and, and fetters, and he would always break those chains and still cry like a, a lunatic out among the tombs, and, and the people would, would keep on trying to do this, and to no avail, this man would always break these chains, and he was always night and day in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. But Jesus showed up on the scene. Jesus showed up on the scene. And this man, verse 6 of Mark chapter 5, this man, it says, when he saw Jesus. When he saw Jesus. He ran and worshipped him. The scripture mentions that he ran and worshipped him. And he had seen Jesus afar off. And even though it was afar off, he still had the response of running to Jesus and worshiping him. Even though he had these demons, these devils that were possessing his life, he still ran to Jesus and worshiped him. I can't imagine, as, I, as, I'm, as I was thinking about this passage of Scripture, I can't imagine having to deal with this situation, not only the people in the city, but even this man having these legions of, of demons. I can't imagine that he wanted this to be the case, that he wanted the devils to be in control of his life like it was. Such a desperate situation. But when he saw Jesus, he saw the answer to his need. And he ran and worshipped and, and called out to Jesus for help. I think, I think of some people that when they see Jesus, maybe they run away a little bit and maybe hide. I think of Adam and Eve in the, in the Garden of Eden after they had partaken of the forbidden fruit and God came walking through the garden and it was in the cool of the day calling for Adam, Adam, where are you? He said, I've, I've hidden myself because I know that I've sinned. But that's, that's not the thing to do when we see Jesus. We need to take an example from this man of Gadara when he saw Jesus. He ran to Jesus and worshipped him. He ran to him in spite of all the things that he was facing. He ran to him. Think about this. God will always give you a chance for a choice. He will always provide an opening for you to make a choice. When Jesus showed up on the shores... The Bible lets us know that it was a good way off. It was a far off, the words of the scripture. And I don't know if you've thought about it before, but do you think that maybe Jesus could have showed up directly in front of the man? I'm convinced the reason why Jesus showed up at a distance from the man, he was giving him a chance for a choice. He saw Jesus at a distance. He could have chosen to run the other direction if he would have wanted to. But he chose when he saw Jesus to run to him and worship him. Every day that we live, we're given a choice. We're given a chance for a choice to worship or not. To serve him or not to serve him. To praise him or not to praise him. Every circumstance we face in life, we're given that chance for a choice. Am I going to praise him or am I not going to praise him? Am I, am I, am I going to say, woe is me or am I going to exalt his name? Am I going to find somebody else to magnify the Lord together with? Am I, am I going to praise him? Am I going to let my life be a living testimony of what 
God has done and how good he is to me. Amen. I wonder maybe this morning if we could stand together and maybe... Maybe you're facing a situation today, and I know this is Sunday school, and you know I'm not, not going to make it too heavy a time. Hopefully it's not been too heavy for you. I know that the example that I read earlier about the man being trapped, cutting off his arm, is a little, little bit extreme, but it really happened. It was a really desperate time for this young man. And maybe you're facing a desperate situation today. Amen. But God is here today to help you. God is here today to minister to you and to throughout this whole day, even as we go into the next service, our family worship time, if you will reach out to the Lord in spite of the situation maybe that you're facing and you will praise God, you begin to worship Him, begin to exalt Him. Find somebody else if if, if you feel like you want to find somebody else and, and magnify the Lord with them, I'm sure whoever you go to, they'll be happy to, to worship the Lord with you. They'll be happy to praise the Lord with you. Amen. God bless you today.